Grace and peace to each of you this morning. We welcome you to this service of worship for Palm Sunday. And we invite you to take time now, if you have not yet, we have a bulletin that has uh, been put online on Friday from Rita and the office here. If you would like to follow along in the liturgy, um, this would be a good time, if you have not downloaded that yet, to do so, and we will be joining together in our worship uh, shortly after our announcements this morning. There are several announcements to make. Um, one is that we made some new changes in regards to how we're doing our worship um, during this time. And um, we're splicing together different parts of the worship so that none of us has to be, none of us is in the room together at the same time. In fact, this is uh, being recorded in my office. Uh, we're able to splice in music from last year's Palm Sunday service. And from here out, we'll be doing the same thing with uh, music from a previous year or previous worship service that was already recorded. And um, that will allow for you to hear the choir. Um, they are not actually in the sanctuary, as you will recognize, but um, this allows us for a little bit more uh, normalcy in, in our order of service. Uh, one of my greatest disappointments has been the fact that we've not had the opportunity this year to have the Holy Week service, nor the, um, the Monday Thursday service or Easter. And so we've arranged with the ministers in town, uh, there are five of us that will be uh, having the Holy Week services. You can go online uh, when it's convenient for you, starting Monday, and uh, those Holy Week services uh, for each day will be available. I would encourage you, to, if, if you're able to, to take the time during the noon hour uh, on Monday so that the majority of us are together in our worship during the Holy Week meditations. Um, there are five different pastors who will be involved in leading that service. It will be abbreviated without music this year. Jason and I will pre-record a service, um, a special service, I've talked to him about going up to the cemetery and having an Easter sunrise service. Now, as of this point, it looks like we're scheduled for rain on Easter Sunday. But my plan is that we pre-record earlier in the week during a sunrise and have a sunrise service for you all to be able to be a part of on Sunday morning. So if you get up early on Sunday and would like a sunrise service, it will be there for you on your, on your computer, uh, this same resource here of YouTube. And it will also be available anytime throughout the day for those who would like an Easter service. My plan is that we will expand the meditation that I normally have for that Easter sunrise service and uh, there will be more of music that will inter be interspersed in there. Uh, possibly, Lori and I will be um, singing up at the cemetery when we do this, but we will keep you posted as time goes by this week and our plans unfold. Now, let us repair our hearts for the worship of Almighty God.
With your bulletin, please join with me in the call to worship. Look, your king is coming, humble and riding on a donkey. Hosanna to the son of David. Lay your cloaks before him, spread palms to honor him. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Raise your voices, lift your hearts, rejoice, our Savior comes. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Friends, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is merciful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Friends, join with me now as we share together in unison the prayer of confession. Suffering God, the way of your cross is a perilous journey. It is frightening. It is demanding. It is fraught with peril. You ask us to stay by your side as you journey into Jerusalem and on toward Calvary. But weariness and fear overtake us, and much like the first disciples to betray you, we deny you. We abandon you. Don't abandon us as we face a threat of this virus, Lord. Forgive us and strengthen us for this lonely journey ahead. Give us courage to face the pain and suffering all around with compassion. And as the darkness gathers in our lives, give us faith, 
Fill us with hope and empower us with your healing grace. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please take a moment of silent confession. Friends, this saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Amen. Good morning, WPC kids. I hope you're doing well. Do you ever argue with your family about what's fair? You know, like, it's not fair that you got the last cookie and I didn't. Or, it's not fair that the family across the street went to the park and we're not going. Sometimes we spend so much of our energy worrying about what's fair that we forget to even have fun. It reminds me of a story that I wanna to read to you. It's uh, called The Price of Envy. It is a very old story out of the treasury of Jewish folklore. Listen to this. While a poor woman stood in the market selling cheese, a cat came along and carried off a cheese. A dog saw the cat and tried to take the cheese away from him. But the cat stood up to the dog, so they went to fighting. The dog barked and snapped. The cat spat and scratched. But they could bring the battle to no decision. Let's go to the fox and have him referee the matter, the cat finally suggested. Agreed, said the dog. So they went to the fox. The fox listened to their arguments very carefully. Foolish animals, he said. Why carry on like that? If both of you are willing, I'll divide the cheese in two, and you'll both be satisfied. Agreed, said the cat and the dog. So the fox took out his knife and cut the cheese in half. My half is smaller, said the dog. The fox looked very carefully through his glasses at the dog's half of the cheese. You're right, he decided, so he went and bit off a piece of the cat's share. That will make it even, he said. When the cat saw what the fox did, she began to yell. Just look, my part's smaller now. The fox again put on his glasses and looked very carefully at the cat's share of the cheese. Right you are, said the fox. Just a moment, and I'll make it right. And he went and bit off a piece from the dog's cheese. This went on so long with the fox nibbling, first at the dog's and then at the cat's share, that he finally ate up the whole block of cheese before their eyes. So you see... Sometimes, whenever we spend too much time and energy worrying about what's fair and what's not fair, we completely miss out. My hope for you during this time is that you learn to give to one another and that you learn to not worry so much about what you're missing out on, but worry more about the things that you can take part in. As we come to our pastoral concerns this morning, I've got good news to share with you. Gunnar Harbison is home after being in the hospital most of the week. I just spoke with him earlier this morning and he is getting stronger and feels optimistic and encouraged by the progress he's making. He's been told there is no infection left in his body and he is looking forward to a time of recovery at home and uh, Marsh is greatly relieved that he's finally home now. Jim Hartman also had uh, good news and conversation with him earlier this morning. He is uh, still impacted by thrush as a side effect to the medication that he was on, the steroids. His energy level has been affected, but um, he has gone through a round of, of chemotherapy now and 
continues in his radiation treatments and is making good progress. Both he and Marion are in good spirits and are grateful for the love of this congregation. Linda Brinkley Deal, um, who is a cousin of Jim Brinkley, is in the hospital, uh, I believe Fry Hospital, and is uh, recovering from a severe loss of blood. So we keep Linda in our prayers. Um, Lois Blaynot, we learned earlier this week that she had died. Um, she lived in Florida for the last 12 years. Uh, moved down there shortly after I got here to um, and she was the wife of uh, George Blaynot and um, at this point I'm, I'm unaware as, as to the uh, specifics of, of her burial but uh, we remember the Blaynot family and her loss. We also want to lift up our sister church, Nueve Jerusalem, in Guatemala, um, outside of Cuatepeque. Um, they are struggling as, as people around this world are struggling with this coronavirus. The impact of this has on their lives is uh, as much financial as, as it is anywhere. And with less reserves and less resources, um, it's a greater burden for the folks in our sister church to bear right now, and um, we do not have an idea as to how long that will be. Louis Guru will be turning 100 on uh, Tuesday, April 6th, and uh, we celebrate his birthday and 100 years of, of life and his uh, many ways of serving the community. We ask your blessing and uh, your remembrance to, to him as he celebrates his 100th birthday. Then I got word from Betty Wilson that uh, Van Mooney is in the Grace Hospital um, on a respiratory machine and had been struggling with um, dialysis for some time, but now they think it's possible that he has uh, coronavirus, but they're not sure uh, and are in the process of waiting on test results to come back. So we keep them in our prayers, Van uh, Mooney in our prayers as well. Let us turn to God in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Lord, you came into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey reminding us that your love is accessible to human life, that it is not one that is lorded over human life and distant and removed as most sovereign leaders have been throughout history. We ask, O oh Lord, your guiding and compassionate love to be with those that are struggling this day with with illness in their lives, whether it be the coronavirus, for there are hundreds of thousands around the world that are impacted by this. In fact, over a million people have been diagnosed and are struggling and suffering with coronavirus now around the world. Many hundreds of thousands in our own country, over 7,000 deaths. Lord, we are mindful that as we as a country and as the world continues to struggle with how to respond to this virus, that there are many who disregard the best medical advice and scientific advice of our leaders. And we ask that you will bring about wisdom into those people's lives, that they may respond with the stay-at-home order and try to halt the spread of this. Lord, people are so full of their awareness that they want to retain their own freedom, their own liberty, and even churches are doing that. And we recognize that this is only going to prolong this agonizing wait. And we pray for guiding spirits to lead those churches and those hearts to an understanding 
that we're all in this together and that it's in all of our best interest to be safe and take care of ourselves and follow the guidelines of our nation's leaders and our, our scientific and medical community. We pray, Lord, for those that face different kinds of illness or medical issues such as cancer. We offer our support for our own who are going through chemotherapy. We remember Jim Hartman and we also lift up Gunnar Harbison as he is finally home from the hospital and ask for your healing strength to be with him and with Jim as, as they both undergo the continuation of their well-being and their, their treatments. We pray, Lord, for Linda Brinkley deal with her severe blood loss. We pray for the Blaynot family and the most recent death of Lois and are mindful also of them as they continue to mourn the loss of Ed. We pray for all families who have lost loved ones, and there are many now in our congregation. We lift up Sanford and Brenda Welburn um, as they continue in their loss of Stephen Christenberry, as we offer up also Casey Braswell, his, his half-brother and ask your blessing to be with each of them in their loss. Guide us, Lord, as we move forward, for we seek to be faithful to you, faithful to each other in the way that we resolve, work towards a resolve of this great global crisis right now with the pandemic. And we ask your healing strength to be with throughout this world, to bring hope and guidance and comfort and reassurance that we will live to see better days and that your guiding hand is always with us. For we offer this prayer in the name of the one who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
As we come to the reading of God's word, let us turn first to God in prayer. Holy and gracious Lord, around this world people are in need of reassurance, in need of the constancy of your love, especially in a time of great crisis. We ask, O Lord, as we come to the reading of your word, that our minds may be open to its application in our lives today. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. From Matthew 21, starting with the first verse and running through the 11th verse. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied, a colt, with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna! to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is a prophet, Jesus from Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Many years ago now, I had a friend who was a manager of a sports stadium at the University of Mississippi. He invited me one day along with him to open up before a major sporting event there, a big basketball game that was being planned. It was strange walking into the arena with no one there. The lights were off, the place was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. As I stood in center court, he went off to turn the lights on. And as the lights were turned on, you could hear the buzzing of those big halogen lamps. And to watch slowly but surely the, the light begin to illumine the, the entire uh, stadium there. I marveled at the contrast between the quiet and what would soon be happening within the hour as the sports, as the, the two teams came and started their practice and warm up. And then within an hour and a half later after that, the, the actual game was starting with the stadium filled with, filled with people. I felt privileged to see a major sporting arena empty. And yet these days, when that has become the norm, it's anything but comforting to see that. It was a novelty to be in a public venue like that alone. But the impact has worn the shiny off of that with the kind of emptiness that we see in the world around us as we travel on our our way to and from different locations these days where people are encouraged to stay at home and I'm grateful they are. Certainly other than going to the store or coming here to church that has been my routine. But think about it. This year we had no March Madness, no NASCAR races, no movie premieres, no Merle Fest, no Three Penny Opera, not even a free piano recital. No Olympics will happen this year. St. Patrick's Day Parade was canceled 
and the Easter parades that normally happen in some large cities have been canceled. This will be the first Palm Sunday in my career that I've not had a processional as part of the first of the beginning of the service. And it'll be the first in 12 years, 13 actually, that Holy Week services will happen here at the Waldensian Presbyterian Church that I haven't participated in with the rest of you. Life as we know it has been canceled for the time being. It feels like standing in an empty sporting arena these days, whether it's in an empty sanctuary as we have here or anywhere you go around town. So where's the good news this morning? Keep in mind the good news of Palm Sunday was an event, a holy event that had political overtones to it. It is not a feel-good story in a vacuum. There have been times over the years when I thought that I, that people were reacting to Palm Sunday as if it was just a feel-good pageant of sorts and once it was over it was on back to life as normal. But I think this year the Palm Sunday story seems a little bit more urgent to us. Perhaps we may recognize much more keenly what the triumphal entry of Jesus really meant and how it impacts the context of our own real lives. It has been uh, the purpose for us to share the good news uh, that it's relevant to our days as we live in isolation to each other. And the great crowds of people, though, that were gathering at the time of Palm Sunday, the time of Jesus, are still relevant for us today. We call it a triumphal entry. But in all actuality, it was not a kingly parade to celebrate a military victory. Although many in the crowd had harbored those expectations of that, had Jesus been an earthly king entering the capital city, he would have processed in on a war steed at the head of an army, and he would have possibly worn a, a robe and a victory crown of laurels as he went into town. But that isn't what we read here. It says that Jesus was riding on the back of a donkey, a common farm animal, a lowly animal, one that fulfills the old Hebrew Bible prophecy of the, pro of the prophet Zechariah, humble and mounted on a donkey on the colt, the foal of a donkey, the prophet says. The imagery was perplexing to many in the crowded streets and the time of Jesus' day, for they were looking for a kingly, warrior, political leader who would overthrow Rome and its authority in their lives. And their expectation was not questioned at that point in time, because everyone was just filled with the moment and shouting loud hosannas. What they were looking for, though, they didn't get. Think of the ideal qualities that we ascribe to a great world leader, a skilled communicator, a person who exudes wisdom and strength of character, a person who can get things done effectively and efficiently, a person who has compassion for his people, and her people and well-being of the citizens of the nation and the world. Then, as now, many would like to add the note of a conqueror, which gets us back to this military theme once again. What is not on that list are the qualities of meekness and humility, and yet those are the very qualities that Jesus himself exhibited, as well as being a good communicator and many of the other qualities we mentioned. In the famous 1970 musical, 
Jesus Christ Superstar by Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice. Jesus is per se, per, portrayed as entering into Jerusalem and a crowd shouting, Hosanna, hey JC, JC, will you fight for me? That really is a pretty accurate vernacular interpretation of what the crowd was expecting in that day and time. Someone who would fight for them, who would destroy the Roman overseers. Bring on the warrior king, the one who will lead his 12-member war cabinet in a popular uprising over the Romans. See what I mean by political overtones in this text? They're there. They wanted a powerful deliverer, a real Messiah, one who would accurately and effectively overthrow the military force. That would have been some trick worthy of a great spectacle in Jesus' day and worthy of performance in the Colosseum of Rome. Remember that term Hosanna in Hebrew? It actually means we beseech you, O Lord, to save us. Save us. Hosanna. It isn't a gleeful hurrah that children sing and that we tend to give an understanding of as, as if it's a celebratory announcement. No, it was more of a cry for deliverance. We beseech you, Lord, to save us. Deliver us. The wonderful Palm Sunday hymn that Lori and I had chosen weeks ago for this event as a response to pardon is the hymn, Right On, Right On in Majesty. In sharp contrast with the political Messiah that the crowds were expecting, verse 2 articulates a different image, the image of the true nature of Christ. Right on, right on in majesty. In lowly pomp, ride on to die. O Christ, thy triumphs now begin, or captive death, or conquered sin. There it is. Instead of royal splendor, Christ comes into town on lowly pomp. He rides a donkey, not a war steed. Instead of destroying the military might, he destroys the, hang the stranglehold of death and sin over our lives. There's a triumph. There's a victory. There's a focus for the Hosannas. Not the kind of action we would celebrate in a vast arena of public entertainment. It is one that, though, addresses the deeper human needs in each of us. Deliverance from ourselves deliverance from that which destroys our sense of life, our own sins, our own brokenness, our loss. It wasn't by accident four years ago that the same Pope Francis, who humbly addressed the Waldensians for the first time in 850 years, asking for heartfelt apology or offering a heartfelt apology for the atrocities of over 600 years of Roman Catholic oppression of the Waldensians. He did that in a way of asking and trying to resolve and restore the right relationship between the Waldensians and the Roman Catholic Church. Relationships between Christians and each other. This would be the same Pope who, a few months later, as he went to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania that year, instead of riding in on in a limousine or in the Pope mobile with all the bulletproof glass, this Pope rolled, rode into town on a Fiat Cinquecento, a modest compact car, still white, which frequently stopped in the crowd so that he could meet the people face to face. It was his way of saying, we serve a Lord who is humble, and this is the way that a leader in the church 
should offer humility to the people of God. Humility to the people of God is what Jesus teaches us. He relinquishes the world's trappings of greatness and embraces the qualities of meekness and humility. And we find in him not only a general, gen, genuine connection with God, but a greater connection with humanity as well. And that can be done away from the high profile of the public eye. Humility and meekness. How is that done in your life? This year on Palm Sunday, instead of children and a choir processing in psalm with palm branches, with celebratory hosannas, we can proclaim our faith on a phone call to a single older adult that may not have had the opportunity to even say hello today to someone. Instead of watching a movie, a deacon this past week has taken food to a person in their home, to an individual who lives in a high-risk category. Another family spent part of the day making protective masks to be shared with the local hospitals. A mother encouraged her children to draw pictures of spring, bunnies and flowers and fluffy white clouds to mail to older members of this church. Five people can make up a list of individuals and situations spending an hour in prayer in their own homes. A young woman can write a card for homebound members. A father can spend time writing to his children and sharing his love with them. And a small child can go outside and pick violets in the yard to bring to his mother. All of these are meek and humble expressions of love. Each of these remind us of the love of God that has come to us humble and riding on the foal of a donkey. This is the way that Christ lives his life, humble and meek, the kind of orientation that makes a difference to people in everyday life. That's what made a difference in our lives, the humility of Christ. Oh yes, hospitals still need ventilators, face shields, and healthcare workers still need testing kits and an extra dose of energy and endurance in these terrible days. Individuals and businesses still need relief checks in the mail, and grocery stores still have empty shelves that need stocking, and some of us are running out of TP. We still need to see our government coordinate the many responsibilities to address these needs. But beyond that, beyond the chaos and confusion caused by this virus in the world, we need something that the world cannot give. Something expressed through humility and love and meekness. Love with flesh on it. And it is our duty, our responsibility, our ability to be able to share that even when we have social distancing as part of our lives. We can still share that with others. For Christ shares that with us every day. And the assurance of his love through the Holy Spirit in our lives. And now may the God who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus be and abide with us this day. Amen. I invite you to join with me now as we share the affirmation of faith which you'll find in your bulletins. Let each of you look not to your own interests but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, 
he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has also has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I invite you to join together as we offer our gifts of love and gratitude to God. offer our gifts to God. Heavenly and gracious Lord, we live our lives in these uncertain days, but the certainty of your love remains with us in all that we do. We ask your blessing as, and ask you to receive these gifts that we offer from our own lives, from our own abundance, when there are, is great need in this world. Help us, Lord, to remember our neighbors. Help us, Lord, to remember those that we have never met who are in desperate straits themselves. For we offer this prayer in the name of our Lord, asking your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, friends, as we continue in our journey through Holy Week and towards Easter, I invite you to remember to join with us on throughout the week in the Holy Week services provided by the other ministers in town and to return to join with us on Sunday morning for a sunrise service at the cemetery remembering that the gift of resurrection life is eternal and that our lives have been blessed by it. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.